thank you. Those of you on the platform, let's show them that we truly appreciate. That we appreciate them this morning. Amen. I suddenly realized that uh, my Bible was at the back and my offering was in my Bible so that uh, God does not strike me down. I had to run to the back, put my offering, just as you've done yours. Just before we hear the word of God being preached this morning, I just want to go on record to let you know that COVID-19 is still alive. Oh, say amen. Some of you don't believe that. It's only when you come to church you try and pretend as though you're COVID compliant. Uh, it's still very much around. And uh, you've got to continue to observe all COVID protocols. Uh, we would not let you come into the assembly if you ignore those standard protocols. Uh, you may not uh, have COVID-19, and I pray not. We've had incidents of that here. But you don't know if the next person to you does have. You have no idea. And, uh, and so we don't want any panic in our church Remind yourself that there's an exit and there's an entry. Uh, there is a need for you to wash your hands and stay as away as possible from people. I'm seeing people this morning hugging one another. And uh, be careful. Okay, that's all I can say. And uh, even if you've received the vaccine, uh, it's not uh, a guaranteed immunity that yes, you've received the vaccine, uh, you, are, you can do whatever you want to do, uh, hug whoever you want to hug, you are the most dangerous people. Those that haven't received, uh, they know the score. If you have, uh, you better be more aware. Uh, for some of us, we have received, we've received the first and the second dose, and I didn't grow a third hand. Uh, say amen, I'm not deranged. Uh, I need to function, I need to preach the gospel in churches. I haven't done that in almost two years, uh, and I'm not going to be held crippled uh, by fear. Uh, we would go one day, say amen. And uh, uh, it's good to go doing the will of God. Say amen. Okay, so you, uh, you have your own decisions to make. You have a right to your decisions, uh, so do I have, and I'm not uh, sort of forcing that you've got to do that, but COVID restrictions and things must still be adhered to. We had a wonderful time yesterday, uh, perhaps one of the best seminars that we've had in our church uh, in a while. We had a single seminar in this place. It was so powerful, so exciting. Uh, we had about 20 uh, single men and women come to church. Uh, we had a good, uh, great time. Uh, we were meant to have a three-course meal, but I don't know what happened. The women chickened out last minute and it rained. So uh, we understand that. But despite the rain, the turnout was highly encouraging, and uh, we had a great time. But uh, we married couple. We must top that. Say Amen. We're going to be having a marriage seminar. My hope is that we would go away to a hotel somewhere and spend that night there. And uh, uh, how be it, uh, you know, they will, they will cater for us, have lovely candlelight dinner, <laughs> choo choo, candlelight dinner, uh, swimming pool, and then uh, in the morning, breakfast in bed. <laughs> we'll see, based on the meeting today, <laughs> but 
that's my desire. And uh, this COVID-19 has, has caused many of us to forget romance, but we want it back. Say amen. Yeah. Only Pastor Heisen said amen. Say, say amen, everybody. Yeah. Okay, praise God. We need to remind ourselves that uh, we love our spouse. Mark chapter 16, if you have your Bibles there with you. Uh, Mark chapter 16. Every time I stand behind the podium here to preach, I'm fearfully and frightfully aware that my words carry weight before the hearers, and they better be from God, that God has a say in what I preach. And so it also helps whilst either preaching or during the course of the week, you pray for me that God speak to pastor so that he might minister to the needs of the people. So this morning, I want you to mark it down, okay? Every good thing that comes from our lives comes to our lives because of our connection with God. Oh, you missed a good place to say amen. amen. Everything that you are or have comes because of your connection with God. It is a gift of God. It is a favor of God. We have a calling. We have a connection with God. And this connection and calling is to represent Christ, to act on his behalf in his character and spirit. That we exemplify Christ wherever we are, under every circumstance that we fa we're faced with, and towards all men. As we read our text this morning, you can but help to uh, get a glimpse of the heart of God. Mark 16, verse 15, the Bible says these words, if you'd follow with me. Then he said unto them, go into the whole world and preach the gospel to all creature, creation, or some verses of the creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned, and these signs will accompany those who believe, you and I believers. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hand, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They would place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. I want to minister out of this text a revelation that I got from God a sermon I've entitled, Our Supernatural Calling. Our Supernatural Calling. The first thing I'd like to consider with you is the believer's instruction. Today, we are going to go a little bit deeper than some of you have ever been. We're going to delve a little bit further, deeper and further. We are going to enter into the plan of God for our lives. What exactly could this be? He has given us an instruction, and this godly instruction that he had given unto us is not a complicated instruction. Say amen. amen. This is not something that you need an encyclopedia to uh, uh, unravel. What is it trying to say here? These instructions um, are for our own benefits uh, that when carried out uh, according to his dictates. When you do what God says you should do, it will benefit you. There are dangers uh, for non-compliance. There are repercussions and consequences uh, for disobeying these instructions of God, some of these extreme consequences could lead to death. Others will simply disqualify you from God's plan and God's blueprint for your life. 
When you do not follow his express instruction, there is a danger that you and I can easily become disqualified. We know this is true. When you look at the life of Moses, God had spoken to Moses. He says, I want you to speak to the rock and water that is required by my people will come forth, but in frustration and perhaps because of past experience, Moses rather struck the rock and as a result of that, God passed an eternal judgment on him. He says, because you have not hallowed me, you have not obeyed me, you will only get the people to the edge of the promised land, but you yourself will not enter into it. This is the consequence of not following God's instruction. He spoke unto a king by the name of Saul. He gave him an instruction. He says, wipe out all the Amalekites. Kill every one of them. Animals, women, children, men, wipe them all out. But we know what Saul did. Saul kept for himself, for himself and for his men the best of the Amalekites. And as a result of that, immediately God judged him as, and disqualified him from becoming and remaining to be the king of Israel. God has given you and I specific instructions on how to worship him. Now, we know that here in Africa and in Nigeria, we have been exposed to a particular form of worship. And in our mindset, this is what God wants. But John chapter 4 in verse 20 expresses what God is looking for when it comes to worshiping him. Our ancestors in verse 20 says, worshiped on this mountain but you Jews claim that the place to be worshipped uh, is in Jerusalem. The woman replied, Jesus. Uh, and then Jesus said to him, uh, I have, believe me, uh, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Um, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. Uh, we worship what we do know uh, for salvation um, is from uh, the Jews. Yet a time is coming uh, and has now come when those true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that God seeks. God is spirit. And his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter what your personal convictions are. If you are in error or you are harboring sin and you could dance and sing and play music, you are not a true worshiper. There is no pleasure in God of, uh, uh, when you worship him in error. He frowns at that. He has given us a blueprint on how to worship him. Jesus is dealing here with an ignorant woman that has taken on board the traditions of men and brought it into an equation assuming this is what pleases God. Care must be taken this morning. For you and I to follow God's instruction expressly. And I know sometimes the instructions of God interfere with our comfort. Many times it, it intrudes. Many times it comes at an unexpected time. The children of Israel were given specific instruction on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. It doesn't matter whether Bezalel is an artisan or skilled in many ways. God says, this is how I want you to build the Ark of the Covenant. Your opinion doesn't matter here. Follow my instruction. Good preaching. And then he also later on, Jesus is instructing his disciples. He's sending them forth in the book of Luke chapter 10 in verse 3 to 4. He says, go, I am sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Do not take purse or bag or sandals or do not greet anyone along the way. In other words, when you are going to face this enemy, follow my instructions. 
Not only do we read that, we read about Jericho, the very first combat zone. They are coming out from Egypt. They are across the, uh, the, the Red Sea. They come into a land of Jericho. And as I approach this, uh, here is a fortified city. Uh, and God tells them, uh, don't do anything. Uh, just walk around Jericho seven times. And on the last day, walk around it seven times for seven days. Uh, and you know, uh, there's always going to be one person that thinks he knows better than God. And so they're walking around. You can see them grumbling or retaining, holding back. They want to talk. They can't talk. And then they walk around Jericho every day, seven days, and on the seventh day, seven times. And without any effort from them, uh, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. See, God don't need us to establish his victory. All he needs us to do is to follow his instructions. He can fight on our behalf victoriously. And so we know Jonah. Well, many of you know Jonah. Jonah is told, go and preach to that wicked city called Nineveh. And I want you to preach against them. Jonah would not do that. Jonah is a man of God. Uh, and just so Jonah fled away from there uh, and he went to Tarshish. Uh, and all you know the rest of the story. Uh, and God gave him um, a fright of his life. Uh, he took him straight down to Shoel, hell, uh, and placed him in there for three days in the belly of the fish uh, and vomited him out uh, into the very place that he's running away from. You will obey God whether you like it or not. We know of Samson. Samson had been told from birth, uh, and his mother was told prior to conception that no razor shall to touch his head. Would well, it be nice if Samson had looked at Delilah's handbag to find out whether there's a flint or a blade hidden in there. Don't touch any dead carcass. Don't drink any intoxicating wine. And the very things that God told Samson not to do were the very thing that he was attracted to doing. I'm going somewhere with this. Because there are forces that want us to disobey God. And many times we rather partner with those forces. Our calling as believers is to fulfill the great commission. He has given us a mandate. He didn't tell us to build churches. He didn't tell us to establish schools. He didn't tell us to have hospitals. Can I have a witness? He says, go ye therefore and preach the gospel uh, to those that have died in sin and lost. Uh, and uh, go there and declare Jesus is Lord. That is a simple commission. That is a great commission. That is a, an express instruction. Go and do this. You and I could do this wherever we are. You could do this if you're an employer. You make sure your employees abide with the ground rules of your organization. If you are a, a father, you could do this. If you engage or employ uh, artisans or you engage a uh, security outfit, you preach to them. There are souls of men. And you will have fulfilled the commission that God has given unto us. Uh, we have been sent by God to share his good news to all the creature of the world. And the reason for this is very simple. Very clear. And the reason for this is because salvation of the lost souls of men is at the heart of God. You've missed a good place to say amen. All that God is interested in is that man will reconcile to him. That's all. And every other thing will be added, uh, given time. Uh, but uh, man must find hope in salvation. Man must find uh, reconciliation in salvation. Man uh, otherwise would end up in the devil's hell uh, without the Savior's grace upon their life. He has come to seek and save that which is lost. And then he says that those that believe, those that believe will be baptized. Not just in water as we are going to do this morning, but they would also be baptized by the Holy Spirit. And if you are claimed to be a believer and you are yet to do this, then I challenge your belief. 
One of the things that exemplifies a man's belief is I'm willing to identify with the death and the resurrection of Christ and I'm hoping to be empowered by his Holy Spirit. Those are the things that identify us with Christ, not the name of the church that you go or the pastor that is your favorite pa preacher. What identifies us with Christ, those that believe, and then from that belief system and that empowering by the Holy Spirit, every other thing that we read in our text can be experienced. That there will be forces that want to poison you. The Holy Spirit will quicken you. That there will be a danger. You will be in presence of danger. And the Holy Spirit will defend you. But there is no point saying, I go to church, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, and you are yet to be empowered by God or you are yet to respond to the commission. So I want to look with you secondly this morning at believers' opposition. Because you better understand it, your beliefs will be opposed. And there is a reason for that, and I will explain, expose that to you this morning. I declare to you that there are forces, real forces, that remain committed to opposing you not because you are good looking or you dress smartly, they would oppose you because you become a believer. The day that you surrender your life to Christ, you literally escape from the claws and the hold of the devil and you recognize there is a loss. And he would not sit back and just watch. He would engage in a real combat Wanting to gain back your soul. He will fight dirty. He will fight continually. He will fight vigorously. Say amen, somebody. He will fight you endlessly. He will knock on the door of your heart until you get frustrated and you vexingly open the door and he will come back. The opposition is real. We see that this can happen in flesh and in blood. There are physical beings that are determined to frustrate believers. There are government policies that are there to frustrate believers. And you better get the understanding of this, but this flesh and blood that I'm referring to, they are not the fiercest of opposition that you ought to expect. Because your aunt Hilda with one tooth is waging war against you from the village, she is not the worst of, and she is not the fiercest of the opposition that you need to fear. Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 12. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Yes, we understand that we have problems with our landlord. We understand we have issues with sometimes our close friends. We're quarreling, we're fighting, but they are not the fiercest of opposition that you need to be concerned about. Behind every physical opposition, there are spiritual forces that are existing. Let me say that again. Behind every physical assault, attack, accusation, uh, condemnation that you face, there are spiritual forces that exist and they are very active. So the question is, what is the reason for opposition? I'm a very gentle person. Why are you opposing me? Number one is to frustrate God's work that is being done. The work that God is doing in you, these forces want to frustrate it. The, the work that God is doing through you and for you and by you, the enemy hates it. The enemy hates the fact that you want to tell another person about Jesus. And it will give you myriads of reasons why you are not qualified enough to do that. Or reasons why you shouldn't even venture into trying to do that. He introduces intimidation and fear. He tells you that he's going to kill your child. He's going to hurt your wife. He's going to hurt your family. But, and he wants to create doubt uh, in your mind and uh, ultimately make you become an unbeliever. 
I don't really believe God anymore, that God is interested in me. I don't really believe God uh, has my back covered. Uh, and so this is a ploy of the devil. And every time that you have this feeling um, or this thought come to your mind, that uh, you are not fighting against flesh or blood. There are hordes, hordes of forces, uh, forces of darkness working against you. They are there. They visit you. Oftentimes, these opposing forces cannot be seen. You don't see them. But you could feel them. How many of you ever felt a presence of evil around you? Oh, come on, somebody. You can just feel something's not right here. Something is strange. This is not normal. I've not just, I've been talking to people and I know it's not you talking anymore. Something has taken over you. All I've done in my life is to love you, and you're talking trash. Something is talking on your behalf. So listen to me very carefully this morning. You feel the presence of evil? The aim is they want to take you to a place where you no longer see what God is doing. You begin to be paranoid about them. You're paranoid about kidnapping. You're paranoid about, and I have been there. You're paranoid about life, about everything. And you forget the fact that there is a God on your behalf. That this is what God says, I am for you. I'll defend you. In the image that you could see, here is a man, all he's relying on is his relationship with God, a Bible in his hand, perhaps even in his heart. But he doesn't see the evil. He doesn't see that, that which lurks in the darkness of this world, uh, ready to pounce on him like a devouring lion. He doesn't see that. Uh, but the enemy knows that there is a stoppage. There is a Holy Spirit uh, that doesn't allow him to perform his act of evil. Something is stopping him. If only you would know what the devil has planned for you and I this morning that hasn't become real because we are on God's side. The devil wants to take the place of God. He wants to be worshipped. These demons want you to be submitted and sub subjected to them. He wants you to recognize their powers. And I've heard people, when bad things happen to them, they begin to glorify that thing. Oh, the devil, oh, he's against me. As the, when, 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 when are you going to start saying, oh, and God is for me, and God is for me. But the devil wants attention. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, he said, Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for the day will not come until the rebellion occurs, and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction, by the way. <laughs> he will oppose and he will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. What the Bible is saying that the devil wants to usurp God's place. He wants to sit and wants to be idolized and wants to be acknowledged as though he is the God. And oftentimes this is done in the church. He wants to sit on the temple where God ought to be. So the second question has to be, how, so how does he oppose us? We understand the reason why he opposes us. He wants to be God. Why does he oppose us? According to our scripture and many other scriptures, these demonic forces attack us physically. This is how they do it. They do it through sickness. We could tell in the Bible, oftentimes, the disciples would approach Jesus and say, who did wrong? This boy, or, uh, or, and Jesus said, no, 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 He's, there's a demonic force. God doesn't need to make you sick in order to gain your attention. Demon forces will throw the darts of sickness, and all of us are subject to it. We fall sick. 
We are not as healthy. I, I, I understand the balance of good food and good health and lifestyle. I understand that. But the devil, one of the tools of the devil is to inflict sickness upon believers. The other thing that he does is mental torture. You're tormented in your mind. You're sleeping, you're in doubt, you question God's authenticity. You question God's passion and love for your life. You're in doubt, you're just turmoiled everywhere. You're tortured in your mind. And then the third thing, and perhaps the most common of the things that uh, the devil uses the most, is what I call poverty. Good preaching. Poverty is a tool from the devil. Okay? Now, I'm not going to knock those of you that are bad financial managers of your own personal finances. But I'm talking about poverty in itself. Let me back it up with scripture. Luke chapter 13, in verse 16, Jesus is talking now about the woman with the issue of blood. Okay? Then, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom, whom who? Whom Satan had kept bound for 18 years long, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her. Jesus did not say it's because you were born in an outskirt part of town. He didn't say because you didn't go to school, that's why you are in bondage of sickness, of the issue of blood. He says, this is an act from Lucifer. He has bound you with sickness for 18 years. This tells us that demonic forces don't mind the duration of their oppression. Why would you be sick for 18 years? Same sickness. And the aim is very simple. Let me tell you what the aim is. In Luke chapter 8, verse 43 to 4, it says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. And, she could, uh, and no one could heal her. She came up behind and took the arm of his garment, uh, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Now we see yet another woman. She's got a, a hemorrhaging uh, and she's bleeding blood uh, continually for 12 years. There are people listening to me this morning. You have had a diagnosis uh, of an ailment uh, beyond one year, two, three years. Uh, and the aim of the devil is to keep you bound. You don't even see yourself as in bondage. But I will expose it to you this morning. Again, we see the forces of evil here. You could tell what's going on with this woman with 12 years of uh, hemorrhaging. Uh, uh, she, she, she has become bankrupt. The Bible says she has spent all her life savings. She doesn't have anybody. She, with, nowhere will we talk about her husband, her children. She's all by herself. She's in isolation. She has spent all that she had. She doesn't have any pension. Sold at home. And there are people, God forbid, uh, that sickness will cause us to begin to run into poverty. We sell every asset, sell every share, sell every home, sell every car, just because we want to leave. Meanwhile, we can just go to Jesus Christ and believe him for our healing. And so what this woman did was the moment she went to Jesus Christ, immediately her bleeding stopped. See, demon forces will bring sickness that will cost you financially. Have you ever been sick and you go to the doctors and they say, today is free? Not here in Nigeria. Before you even drive into the compound, they are charging you. They are charging you. You have to deposit, the, based on how you look, and everything, they will charge you, okay. Did they come in Okada? If they come in Okada, same hospital, they say, okay, just pay 250000 You come in a car, $1 million. You come with one car and three other escorts, you're in trouble. Your brother, your sister driving car here, you have money. Amen. $5 million deposit. Because the aim of the demonic forces is that the sickness that you bear will cost you. Meanwhile, the Bible tells us that Jesus has paid for our sicknesses. He's paid in full. But the devil would not let you see that. 
It is a fact that one of the major tools of, that the spiritual host of wickedness used against us is what I've just exposed to you, now lack and poverty. See, prior to Satan's visitation upon Job, Job was a wealthy man. Come on, somebody. Job was a believer. Job was going to church, amen, and Job was on fire for Jesus, so, and so he had substance, he had children, uh, and so you know, there's a dialogue in heaven between Job and Jesus, uh, and they say, well, have you ever thought about Job? And you know my story about Job, I pray to God, don't recommend me to the devil, I cannot do what Job did, uh, I will not survive. But here we see, and so Job is minding his own business. News comes, uh, your children are dead. Your cattle are gone. Uh, your, uh, everything is gone. From wealth, he is a right man. Because you are a righteous man or you are a righteous woman doesn't excuse you from the devil's attack. Because you go to church, you pay your tithe. It doesn't, you don't become invincible to the devil. And so here we see Job is being assaulted, a righteous, wealthy man before God, and the forces of darkness made sure that he almost lost everything. That he had I had a man in our church many years ago, um, uh, was, a, was a, a, a destitute, had nothing, came to church and uh, supernaturally uh, mingled amongst other people. God bless, God begins to prosper him. He came to some wealth uh, and so uh, uh, he became very filled with pride and I was always looking at it, you need to tamper your pride down because I think your head is bigger than it should be now. And so, uh, but he wouldn't have none of that. He was full of pride. And uh, before you knew it, uh, he had issues with his wife. Uh, he got married in church. Uh, he had issues with that. Threw her out, threw the children out. Uh, he runs into poverty. As, a, as I speak to you today, he walks around the street of New Oko Baba, absolutely stark naked, uh, and he's lost his mind. Lost everything. And so somebody met up with him one day. He recognized a person of the potter's house. Uh, and the first question he asked him, do you still go to the potter's house? The man looked at him and said, yes. And he walked away from him. See, the very thing that you need to walk to is what the devil will make sure you run away from. You need to go back to, to God who gave everything that you have to you. And so here is Job he had to, all his friends were saved and the, until God got involved and humbled him. Say, don't think you are a righteous man. I say you are righteous. That's okay, but you, don't, you should never say you are a righteous man yourself. And as a result of humility, God restored him back. Poverty is a serious assault from the devil. And the devil knows how to keep Africa in bondage because of poverty. It will allow you to go to church, but you're in poverty. Let me tell you what poverty does. Poverty will consume your mind. You can't think about God correctly when you're in poverty, when you're in poverty. I don't know about you, and I'm not talking when you're poor, you're low for cash. We all get to those seasons. I'm talking about you are living in poverty. Are you following with me? Let me tell you another thing that poverty does. Poverty increases your blood pressure. <laughs> How many, how many of you know what I'm talking about? You worry over nothing. You worry, uh, the landlord is just sweeping the compound. You worry, hey, it's going to increase the rent. You're, you're anxious. You're fearful. Your kids are going to school. You make sure that, okay, they don't go in the first two weeks because that's when they ask for the school fees. You go half time, then you go. You, you, poverty makes you just blood pressure. Go to the hospitals. You see who, who's got blood pressure. We know wealth people have, but that kind of blood pressure is a different blood pressure. I mean, when rich people have blood pressure, they've got the money to bring it down. When poverty people have blood pressure, they can't bring it down. Poverty changes your countenance. Good looking people, children of the most high God, they're looking sad, miserable. You're wearing all kinds of, you're there. Everybody's jubilating, I'm happy, but you can't because of poverty. Poverty would make you do strange things. If you fail to face this opposition squarely, mark it down. They have the power to render you bankrupt in every area of your life. 
Their aim is to render you bankrupt, to kill, to rob, and to destroy. Matthew chapter 12, verse 26 to 29. If Satan drives out Satan, then he is divided against himself. How then can the kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, uh, uh, by whom do your people uh, drive them out? So then uh, they will be your judge. Verse 28. But if I drive out, uh, drive it, uh, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come up against you. Uh, and, uh, or again, how can anyone else enter into the strong man's house and carry off his possession unless he first binds up the strong man and then plunder his house? Today, we are going to plunder his house. And that's the essence of my message. And I want to look lastly this morning at the believer's dominion. So a believer can have dominion, you know. The great news and the good news that I have for you is that God has given us the tools for dominion against these forces of darkness. And the greatest tool that God has given us, if I were to ask you what's the greatest tool that God has given us, some of you will say prayer, fasting, this uh, and that, so many other things. Those are tools, but the greatest tool that God has given us is the name of Jesus Christ. God hasn't given us anointing oil as the greatest tool. And why should I fight the demon spirit with an inferior tool when I have a greater tool? Good preaching, Pastor Glenn. Anything else is what I call a wawi. Here, see. Yes, there are tools, but he has given us a great tool that you and I as believers, we have incredible authority. Mark it down. You have incredible authority, albeit, unfortunately, this authority is highly underutilized. People don't use it. So the question is, why don't we use our authority? What's stopping us? And I'm not talking of decreeing and declaring. What is stopping us from using our God-given authority? Number one reason is because we are ignorant of it. I use the word ignorant not because you've never heard the name of Jesus before, but because you don't understand the potency of that name. The other reason why we don't utilize it is because uh, we become very fearful. I know somebody that's saying, I'm using, I'm using the name of Jesus little by little so that it will last me a long time. We become doubtful. There are people that you're doubtful. Does God really want this? Can God really change this? There are others that you are filled with uncertain unbelief. And finally, some of us like me, we want to avoid being embarrassed. You know what I say that about some of us like me? Because if you step out of the boat and walk on water and you find somebody that is sick in their body and you want to pray for them, you know that the, that is the instruction, my first point from God as a believer. You will lay hands on the sick, they will recover. The first thing that the devil will tell you is that what if you do and they don't recover? What if you went into uh, and you pray for them and nothing changes? Now you're going to look like a silly idiot. Everybody's going to mock you now, you know. Even the people watching are going to be watching. Now. Because they're always going to be observers to know whether there's power in the name. And you're going to be there and going to say, well, it's better for me just to wish them well. Sorry, oh. sorry oh, is not the name of Jesus. There's a big difference between sorry, oh. sounds like a biscuit. Sorry, oh. and, and so I, 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 I would say, mm, 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 I, I I'll pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus and all that. And I hope that, okay, don't worry. It's going to be okay. Because we don't want to be embarrassed. Well, there is no embarrassment in the name of Jesus. Whoever is ashamed of me, and whoever will not confess me before men, I will deny. That, fear, that is a fearful statement. I am not the healer. I am simply the helper. If you come to me and think that I am T.B. Joshua, you are wrong. 
My job is to do what God has told me to do, which is to lay hands on you, not to point at you, but to lay hands on the sick and watch what God will do. And if he doesn't do anything, he remains God. You are not going to look at me and say, yeah, yeah, pastor, he calls himself man of God. No one person has ever been healed in his name. Amen. So I, re- I made up my mind years ago, don't put the burden on me. When you get to heaven, if you get to heaven, because now unbelief is living in you, when you get to heaven, ask him, God, why did I end up uh, with that disease? Why did this disease kill me? I went to the porous house. Pastor prayed for me, and nothing happened. I need to... Let me tell you, you wouldn't even have the liver to ask him questions. You'll be glad that you're in heaven. So don't put the burden on believers. That's why most of us don't do it. Or we bring them to the man of God thinking it's only the man of God that has been anointed. This is the authority of every believer. You believe in my name, you will do these things. This is not just for Pastor Glenn or Pastor Yemi. If you are a believer, you can pray for the sick. And they would recover. That's why we think, oh, I've got to go to the Orioke. I've got to go to this special man. I've got to go and find this special oil. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Because these other people don't have power. It is true. We don't have power. God hasn't given us a mandate to be the healers. He retains that for himself. What he has told us to do is to lay hands on you. Matthew chapter 10 verse 30. He says, but when we... He saw the wind. He became afraid and began to sing, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. He says, you of little faith, he said, why did you doubt that I can heal, I can help, I can change? Matthew 13, 58, he says, and he could not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith or their unbelief. You see, even Jesus has limitations. If you also heal people and people are already cynical, or we call out people this morning to come and receive a miracle from God, and you are already, hmm, hmm, let's see what's going to happen. God says, I can't do anything where unbelief lives. Doesn't matter what I do. If you have a doubt that I can do this, he will ask somebody, do you believe I can do this? Yes, but help my unbelief because I'm wrestling with unbelief. And in a church this size, there would be many people that are cynical about healing. There will be many people that have been doubtful about praying for the sick and fearful about the consequence of no action. Unbelief hinders power. Unbelief hinders prayer. Unbelief hinders preaching. I could write the best sermon that God has given me and I'm preaching it, but if you don't believe, then you are not going to receive So the third thing I want to consider with you is how do we enforce this dominion? Very simple. First of all, you have to step out in faith doing what God has called us to do. We will do that today. Or we we, we just step out, God, you've told us to do this, we will do this. uh, And uh, even whilst you're doing it, the enemy will try and intimidate you from doing it, but you do it anyway. Oh, poor pastor, I have, been, I have been prayed for by the best pastors uh, in our fellowship. I have been prayed for even with, with Pastor Mitchell, the great uh, uh, healer. Uh, uh, but uh, nothing has happened. I have been prayed for by all evangelists that have come to our church. Nothing has changed. In our text, God calls us to lay hand on the sick and they will recover. Or recovery will be established. Because the battle must be first won in the spiritual before it's being manifest in the physical. We must understand that we have a God that backs us up. When I pray for people, I'm, I try my best. It's not about me. These are ordinary ever hands, okay? Uh, it's not about me, okay? But you've got to believe God that God will back us up when we pray. Demons will be afraid when he knows that you are willing to pray for people. See, the demons that you're afraid of is actually afraid of you because he knows that you could at any point in time use the name of Jesus. 
Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. You foul demon spirit, I bind you in the name. He knows that you, you could use it. The Bible says that at the mention of that name, every knee will bow. Of the things above, of the things beneath, of the things in the sea. That includes the demon spirit that are hiding in the ocean. Waiting for ships to capsize so that they can have more victory. The ones that fly by night are waiting for air crashes. The ones that visit you in the middle of the night try to enforce you. The one that tempts you and offers you things that will send us straight to hell. It says that the name of Jesus. Have you ever had a situation where you, especially if you recently got saved, you know, you're in your bedroom and there's a host of wickedness in your room. Have you ever had that before? And it looks as though the room is saturated by demon spirits. You're sleeping in the middle of the night. Your wife could be next to you, snoring, nothing. She doesn't even know what you're going through. And you're there, you're sweating and demons are there. You could see them. And all of a sudden, you don't have another. You're like, Jesus! And as soon as you say Jesus, everything goes. How many have ever experienced that before? I've experienced it multiple times, especially when I preach sermons like this and about the blood of Jesus. I know I will be visited tonight. I'm ready with Jesus. <laughs> I'm not talking of putting a pillow, uh, a Bible under my pillow. Hopefully, the words of Jesus will fly into my brains. You've got to have that name at your disposal. I have given you a name above every other name. Hallelujah. Make sure that you don't dialogue with the devil. Seek his consent before you deal with him. Hello, devil. I want to cast you out today, you know. What do you think? Should I? Okay, not today. Okay, I'll come tomorrow. You, you don't dialogue with the devil. As a matter of fact, you catch him unaware. You just, he, he just might as well. Just, you know what? Get thee behind me, you foul demonic spirit. Use your authority. Mark chapter 5, verse 6 to 10 says, when... He saw Jesus from a distance. There was, there was no close contact. He saw Jesus from a distance. And then he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus? Even the devil is crying out to Jesus. Son of the Most High God, in God's name, do not torture me. You are a torturer. So he knows his time is up. For Jesus has said to him, come out of this man, I employ I, uh, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. He didn't ask him, okay, you don't want to leave today, 6,000 of you? Let me take half of you out today, then next week I'll take the other half. Cleared the house. And today we are going to be involved in that. We pulled down some strongholds. Some strongholds. I did mention some of the things that people struggle with. Sickness. Poverty. You know, to to torment of the mind. Just anxiety. These are demonic forces. Luke chapter 10, verse 17 to 19 says, 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in Pharaoh's name. In your name, demons cringe. Demons tremble at your feet. Not because I use Bishop Glenn Botsu. Nah, that doesn't even sound good. Doesn't, doesn't sound good at all. BGB. Maybe sound good. But it wasn't about the bishop's name. Demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus replied and said, I saw Satan himself fall like lightning from heaven. And I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy, and nothing 
will harm you. So the devil tells you, we will hurt you, we will harm you. Glenn, you're preaching this today. We will visit you. Visit me. <laughs> the power is available. The, this power was freely issued out to all those on the day of Pentecost. The power of the Holy Spirit. But it didn't stop on the day of Pentecost. It's applicable even today. And as I close this morning... Acts chapter 1, verse 4 to 8. On one occasion, whilst he was eating with them, he gave them this command or instruction. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father that he promised you, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him to ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom unto Israel? He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates that the Father has set in his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. And you will be witnesses, uh, uh, will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth you would receive that power. That power is not when you find an enemy that you begin to say, Holy Ghost, fire, roast. That is not what that fire is for. You have somebody in mind you want to be roasted. You're never engaged in the real demonic forces of darkness. You don't want to talk to devils. You don't want to fight them because you are timid and you're intimidated by their presence. You rather choose the physical while the spiritual are flexing against you. Today, we are going to go straight to the enemy's camp. And we are going to upset him. And if you still retain unbelief in your heart, you might as well leave the building because just like the sons of Sceva, they might hop on you, whoop you, and deal with you. But today, if you're a believer, God has given us an authority. Let's all stand together this morning. Come, let's all stand together. We have the keyboards come and play a wonderful song in the presence of God. Hallelujah, about the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Let us begin to speak in tongues this morning, everybody. Come on, you're filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, if you are a believer, there is a mandate, there is an authority, there is a calling. There is a supernatural gifting that God has given unto you. Oh, Father, we bless your name. We stand not in our own merits. Come on, you begin to give God thanks, worship him. In spirit and in truth, begin to exalt the name above every other name. Begin to remind yourself of the authority, the mandate that God has placed in your hands, that we will lay hands on the sick and they would recover. God will call upon the hosts of heaven, push back the forces of darkness. Oh, Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you, Holy Ghost. Let every knee bow, let every tongue confess. Jesus, you are Lord. My God, my God, empower your people. Oh, Ribanda Kilebondo Sere. God, you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly. There are people that are sick. In their bodies, God will need you. Shele kondo shela baraba da bamanda. Kierende rema manda rabasanda. Oh, come on, you begin to exalt the name. Let the shackles be broken. Let the burdens be taken away. Let the freedom come. Let the name of Jesus be lifted up. Jesus, you are high and lifted up. Kilarenda mashap. Kenda rebo shikebonda. Mandon can den den Oh, come on, you tell him how much you are ready for him. He's waiting for you. Kia Remondo Kiba Sandara. Oh, God, release your Holy Spirit. Release your Holy Spirit. Release your Holy Spirit. God, we thank you for revelations. We thank you for authority. This is beyond what a man can put together.
this has to do with you, O oh God. Radarabakondo sere mamanda. Oh, hallelujah. If you know you are sick in your body, while the keyboard is playing on, if you know you are sick in your body, I want you to step out of your seat and find a place. You are sick in your body, whatever the sickness might be. I may have mentioned your sickness. I may have not mentioned your sickness. Find a place to stand here. Shalarabando kende masam. You've got high blood pressure. Come on, you've got high blood pressure. Kando re masante bakanda. Oh God. It doesn't matter how many times you've come to the front uh, to be prayed for. Move this way. Where is Yemi? Come on, arrange this, please. Arrange this quickly. Come on. Arrange over there. Shalakondo Shamanda. Hallelujah. God, you be enthroned. Kimananda Rama. Come closer. Come closer. For all the things that I mentioned today, for some of you I mentioned sickness, some of you I mentioned anxiety, some of you I mentioned poverty, regardless of what that situation is, I want you, we're going to, we're going to establish that name, we're going to call upon the name, uh, we're going to cry, this has little or nothing to do with the man of God, this has got to do with the child of God. And if you are an acclaimed believer, then believe that you are standing on holy ground this morning. Believe God that you are not going to walk away from here the way you walked into this building. You better believe God. I, I'm not doing anything special. Or, or I'm just believing God. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm believing God. I'm believing God. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. And as I lead you in that prayer, keep playing. I want to lead you in this prayer. And as I lead you in that prayer, I want you to exercise faith. He spoke to Peter. He said, oh, even if you have just had faith, why did you doubt? What brought you to this altar this morning is an element of faith. I want to see a change. I want to see a difference in my health, in my condition, in my status. Don't allow unbelief to visit you at this altar. Don't allow doubt to visit you at this altar. Skepticism. Just, you, you begin to say, maybe he wants it. No, he doesn't want you that way. Otherwise, he would not have died on the cross and shed his blood for you. So I want to lead you in two prayers. Number one prayer is we need to make sure that we are believers that we have certainty we have a status we have a right we are called children of God we want to enjoy that privilege so that when he bestows his healing on us we will know where it comes from and then those of you where we are praying for them and laying hands on them I want the whole auditorium to shake in praise and shake in the name of Jesus Christ in any language that you can call him so I'm going to pray for you at this altar. Raise up your two hands before God. I say, Lord Jesus, I come before you as a sinner. But I'm asking you to please forgive me of all of my sins. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross because of my sins. I invite you to come into my life. Be my Lord and my savior and i believe by faith that when i should die you will take me to heaven with you in jesus name i pray amen i'm going to pray second prayer if you are able to touch the area of your ailment then you go ahead and touch it as i'm leading you in a prayer if you are unable if something is internal then you can't touch that area then uh, I, I, I'll touch the area. But if you can't do that, I want you to touch your forehead uh, and I want you to cry out to God. Don't doubt this. The blood of Jesus is filtering through you already. Some of you. Come on. Would you begin to lift up your voice, those of you that are back there. 
I really need this place to be filled with the presence of God's glory. I want you to repeat as I say, Lord Jesus. Those of you in front say, Lord Jesus. I come before you as a covenant child. I thank you for the miracle that you are putting into place over my life. I cancel every involvement with sickness, darkness. I bind the wicked one. I take dominion over the plans of Satan. I enforce the authority of a believer, Lucifer, in the name of Jesus. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. I cast you out in the name of Jesus. I command you, take your weapons of sickness away from my life right now. The blood of Jesus sets me free. The blood of Jesus sets me free. The name of Jesus is my strong tower. I run into it. The blood of Jesus. Come on. Begin to touch it. Begin to pray. Oh, come on. Begin to pray. I'm going to lay hands on you right now. Oh, God. Help. Sharakondo. Father, by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, Father, by the name of Jesus, let supernatural healing right now by the Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, Kirarando Shontoko. My God, my God, Sherebondosa. My God, uh, recovering right now in the name of Jesus. Recovering right now uh, in the name of Jesus. Recovering right now uh, in the name of Jesus. Right now by the Holy Ghost uh, in the name of Jesus. Kirebonda, uh, the name of Jesus. Uh, right now by the Holy Ghost. Kirebonda, uh, Rabashantegi. Oh God, we thank you, thank you, Lord. Uh, Maro Come on, let's give God thanks. Oh, he's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to begin to check yourself. I want you to check yourself. Those of you that had an issue that you, you could check yourself right now. I want you to check yourself. Come on, if you would know right now, how many of you would know if anything has changed in you? Come on, how many of you would know, tell you, what has happened? Yes. The, the, the pain has stopped. Keep walking on it. Keep using the name of Jesus. Sorry doesn't help you. Anyone else? Anyone else at all? Come on. Anyone else? You say, you know what? I came here. I had a pain in my body, but I feel it's gone. Let me see your hand. Anyone else? What, what's happened to you? Put the mic on quickly. Okay, this morning, I've, I've been having stomach ache for the past, uh, uh, last week. But this morning I came with this pain. But I, I can't believe in God that I'm going to be healed today. And I, I'm free. I'm free from it. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyone else? Come on, begin to test yourself. You've got to exercise your faith. Anyone else? Mary in there. Come on, quickly. Let's hear what God has done instantly, immediately. They said. Yes, before I came this morning, I was feeling at ache. My blood pressure was off. Yes. But now I can feel it's fine. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, use that name. You are too young. You are too young to have high blood pressure. That He wants to snatch you out. That's what the devil wants to do. You are too young to have those sort of anxiety carrying. Anyone else at all? Well, th those of you that may not be able to check instantly, you're going to go away from here and you're going to be visited by lies. Someone's going to come and tell you or something is going to whisper to you it's not over yet. And the truth is that you can even still feel that it's really not over. But if God says you will recover, you better understand that you will recover. And you need to stand on the authority of the word of God. For those of you that may have come here because of the situation of poverty, I want to tell you something this morning. Uh, you've got to exercise your faith in that area that you know what poverty is not my portion. It's not the reason why he created me, saved me, and redeemed me. It's not so that I'm living in abject poverty. You've got to cancel that ordinance. And when the devil tells you you can't, you tell him, watch me. I can because God says I can do all things. 
Say amen, somebody. We want to we wanna thank you. We're going to be doing other things this morning, such as baptism, but exercise your authority. You will not see me all the time. Amen. I will not live with you. But God lives with you and lives in you. And you call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. I thank you for allowing me to pray for you. Find your seats this morning. Let's sing that song. You are high and lifted up. There is no... Those of you that are going to be water baptized, you need to quickly go and do that now. Go and get yourself ready. Hallelujah. I wish the praise and worship team would come. You are high and lift. Go this way. There is no one like you. Hallelujah. Come on, raise up your hands and sing. your heads and close your eyes with me. You're here today. You're not saved. You're not born again. You're not right with God. Sin lives inside of you. But this morning you say, you know what? I want to surrender my life to Christ. I have heard. I have seen. And I want to belong. And if that's you this morning, I want you to raise up your hand quickly. You don't have an assurance of sins forgiven. If you were to stand before God, you know the heaven's gates are never going to be open to you, but you want them to be opened. Would you raise up your hand quickly? I want to pray for you. Anyone at all? Backslider, would you raise up your hand? The Christians, we did something this morning that the devil wasn't expecting. It's not a one-day event. It's a lifestyle. You've got to commit yourself to enforcing the authority that God has given unto you. Take your hands off my children, you stinking devil. Take your hands off my finances. How dare you? Take your hands off my spouse, my marriage, my job, my business. Who do you think you are? When he tells you who do you think you are, then you tell him that you are a special child of God, washed by his blood, Saved by his grace, prepared for his heaven to enforce your authority. I want you to bow your knees wherever you might be or you come to this altar and begin to say, God, I'm going to start doing that for my life. Come on, you could bow your knees to here. Every believer, Father, I teach me to make war. God, help me, my God, daily that I will take the authority as a believer. Teach me to make war against the forces of darkness.
Achinda Kunsundo Rakama Mama Wanda Kira Bamba Mamabosi Kira Randondo Kundanda Mama Mami Labi I need your special grace healing upon my family my God Supernatural healing Mankunda Mama Kandara Rababa Mama Kira Kundo Shama Kindera Bakunda Yara Ramando Korea Ramando Korea Ramando Kindando Korea Ramando Ramando Kundo Kinda Mama Mando Shama Mama Mama Thank you God bless your name. Thank you for liberty setting us free. Thank you for changing the story of our lives. Thank you for reaching out to us. Thank you, Father. Forces of darkness principalities, powers, rulers of this wicked world. stand, we may find our seats. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. We are going to um, officially with the service close in a word of prayer, but there's going to be a word of baptism. You could find your seats. You could go and find your seats. You know, find your seats. Uh, we are going to be having a water baptism. Uh, service uh, now. And so I want all those that are going to be water baptized to come and stand here. Come. You're going to be water baptized. Who is organizing them? Come on. Peter, come. Come, who's singing songs? Who's... Can the people getting water baptized come to the front? Yeah. Just stand here. Just stand here. Okay. Okay. Where's Pastor Yemi? Okay, so uh, we're going to have their testimonies. Uh, I'm sure they have been, uh, uh, it's been explained to them what to do. Uh, we're going to have their testimonies. Um, give it to the first lady. Give it to the first lady. Okay, so um, we're going to have their testimonies very brief. And uh, you're not going to take a position. Don't take a position. And... Uh, and then they get water baptized. Could you pull the curtain there? Yemi, could you pull, get yourself ready? Pull the curtain. Once you get water baptized, you go out through the Shekinah chamber there. And then, <laughs> and then, um, okay. Now we have the drummer on stage. Do we have to, one by one, drummer and bass? If the singers can stay, but. We went to Udoka. Just go and play drums. Okay. Okay, Peter, get to you. Amen. How many know there's power in the name of Jesus? And let's sing that song. Clap your hands with us. There is power, power, wonder walking power in the blood. Clap your hands with us. There is power. 
seem very spot. Of a land, there is power, power, wonder walking power in the precious blood. Oh, come on, lift your voice. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it was the blood. Come on, for the last time, I know it was the blood. Lift your voice. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. And I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. One, two. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure most of you know me. Good morning. I don't really have anything written down, so this is more of a freestyle. So, what can I say? Everything is a testimony. The fact that I'm here today, like everyone around me, all of you, everything is a testimony. Like, be thankful for just being here, like our lives. And now, I want to get baptized today. You may have been wondering why I've been here since, but let's not talk about that. Uh, I just need to, like, show that I've been saved. You know, as Pastor said, it is the, like, outer display of the inner works, you understand? So now I just want to show that I'm actually saved by, like, displaying the death and resurrection the same way Jesus did. Well, not the same way, but in a manner that I can do. So I'll do it to the best of my ability. And with that, I pass it to Sunday. Yeah, my name is Sunday. We've got the power in the name of Jesus. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. No Satan wages, we shall not be defeated. We've got the power in the name of the Lord. We've got the power, we've got the power. In the name of Jesus, we've got the power. In the name of the Lord, no Satan rages. We shall not be defeated. We've got the power. In the name of the Lord. Okay, my name is Sunday. Yeah, I'm here to baptize because I've not done it before. Oh, I came from a Christian background. My family didn't go to church, but I'm, my life I live, I don't live a Christian life. I live in the world and I do things of my own, choosing that that is the only way I can live. But I came to realize that there is heaven, there is hell. Wherever you choose to go, the ball is yours. Whatever mind you choose, your spirit man will be the one to suffer it for eternity. So... For the past 17 years of my age, I've been, I've been into drug. I do sell drug, smoke, do many things. But I came to realize that there is no life outside Christ. Now, okay, I came to Christ this year. And this year, I gave my life to Christ. This year, I'm baptizing. 
I give God glory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we had the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, demons would have to flee. Cause tell me who can stand before us when we call on his great name Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, we have the victory Good morning, George. My name is Joel E. Oko and I'm from Aquarium State. I just want to thank God for the goodness of God upon my life, for me to be here in the presence of everybody to baptize. I'm very, very grateful. I'm very, very happy. I just want to thank God because my life that I'm living before, I'm going wrong way, many way, but I don't know how my life today is. For the first time that I stepped my leg to Potter's house, that is the day that my life is changed. I'll be somebody that had been living wrong life before, and I didn't go to church for my age, for as I did like this before, but now I'm here for Potter's House, and my life is changing. So I have, I'm here to testify the goodness of God, say, may God take glory and honor for all the good things that he's done for me. In Jesus' name. I will enter his gate with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his court with praise. I will say, This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. 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 I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. I am so glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Good morning, church. I'm Erica Joy Usif, 26 Chief. I want to testify to the goodness of God. But when I decided to do this water baptism, I thought in my life, a lot of things God has done in my life. I, my coming to Potter's house was an inspiration of Bio's life. I know Bio back then, which I think 10 years now, he used to be a very rough person. He used to do a whole lot of stuff. And I was surprised the day when he posted something about church. I said, Bio, you, you now go to church? He said, yes. He said, where? Yeah. He said, I didn't need you. I said, ah, thank God I did not go to church in the morning. Maybe I will join people in the evening. Let me see that God you are serving. You buy your that I know. 
And all of a sudden, I came to church that evening. I think I messed with Sister Kemi, and the welcoming I saw that day was alarming. I, 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 been, I enjoyed myself. So the next Sunday when I got to church, I think I met Pastor Glenn. He prayed for me and a whole lot of stuff. Told me, I think the same time we had a concert or seminar, something like that. A, a pastor, Pastor Beachwell, he spoke to me. What? Beecher, yeah, he gave me a revelation that has done powerful in my life. I think I used to go out with a Muslim person then. A whole lot. We had a covenant, this blood covenant of trust. I think that scared me a lot when I got a confirmation that this is the wrong path I was taking. And trying to adjust was not easy because I was full of fear because you know what oath means now. You were all mad when you would not definitely end up with each other. Pastor prayed with me. I told him, seriously, I'm scared. Though. I don't want to run mad. He told me that it's just normal fear that you're going to join faith with me, Auntie Nike, and a whole lot of people joined faith with me to pray. I want to testify to the goodness of God because right now, the guy is married and I'm not mad. He's not mad. I want to testify to the goodness of God. I think this baptism is a sign of my proof, as in my cleansing from the whole lot of stuff that I've been through and all that. Thank you. He's alive, alive forevermore Alive, alive, alive forevermore My Jesus is alive forevermore oh, Sing hallelujah, hallelujah Sing hallelujah My Jesus is alive forevermore Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah Good morning, church. Um, I'm not going to say much, but um, first of all, I, I want to testify for what God has done in my life. Um, I got saved here in the Potter's house, and right now I'm <laughs> um, being baptized here too, and uh, I really don't have much to say, though, but I just want to thank God for my life and all what he has done for me. I want to thank God for Pastor Glenn and um, everyone. just want to thank God, though. <laughs>
I'm from Kwara State, and I was born in a Muslim family. I got saved there in Patazo, 2018. <laughs> yes, 2018. And I thank God I met Jesus. And he has really changed my life. Because the Bible says, if you might be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. Now I am born again and about to be water baptized. Goodbye, whoa. I can't stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I can't stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Goodbye, world. Goodbye, world. I can't stay no longer with you. Goodbye, pleasures of sin. I can't stay no longer with you. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. I made up my mind to go God's way the rest of my life. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bola Rose, all the way from Wondo State. I've been in Lagos since last year, December, but I'm going to church, actually, household of David, but my auntie that I was going with, she got robbed, she entered one chance. Since then, she has been in uh, Ibadan since last three months. Last week, Monday, she just got back. So, that last sent or upper last week, um, gifts, just like my friend, she invited me to one concert here, and I came since then. I can see that the Lord has actually changed my life. So I'm here to be baptized. Thank you. Rejoice for the steps of the righteous man. They are all that of God. They are all that of God. Rejoice for the steps of the righteous man. They are all that of God. Come on, the time of trouble. Because in the time of trouble, God will uphold you. God will preserve you. God will sustain you. We'll clap those hands. In the time of trouble, hey, my God, God will lift you up. So rejoice your steps. Let's all stand together. God. In the time of trouble, oh, in the time of trouble, God will uphold you. God will preserve you. 
preserve you. God will sustain you in the time of trouble. My God will lift you up. So rejoice your steps are ordered of God. Amen. What a baptism is a powerful thing, much more than you realize. It identifies you with Christ. It identifies you with the body of Christ. It identifies you with the church. And I want to thank those that prepared this one to be water baptized. Uh, we're going to have another one uh, in uh, August, uh, September. We've got another one in September. So if you haven't been and you want to be, be prepared, uh, ask questions. I will explain it to you why you need to do so. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Uh, married couples, uh, remind yourself, please wait behind less than five minutes. If you just converge to this side. Oh, no, they're going to be mopping. On this side, just come to this side, married couples. If you're here for the very first time, you gave your life to Christ, or you're here for the very first time, if you could just meet with Brother Peter right in front on my right here, by your left, that would be great. But the rest of the married couple, just stay and be on this side. Let's bow our heads, uh, close our eyes. Uh, uh, Brother um, uh, Chris Alakwe, close us up in prayer with you. Those of you members of the prison worship team, can you come back to the stage very quickly? Uh, the rest of you, have a great day. See you at 5 o'clock tonight. Members of the worship team, please come back on stage.